Today, I plan to give you the same presentation that I gave in Denmark in 2006. Um, but before giving my presentation to you, there are some terms that I will use. And I want to make sure that we are all on the same bandwidth. These terms may mean something to Muslims, but may mean something else to non-Muslims. So today, I will say the word Allah frequently. And some people think that Allah is the God of Muslims. I will say the word Islam. And still some people think that maybe Islam is uh, one of the religions uh, which they call the heavenly religions or the third religion or a religion founded by someone called Muhammad. We also need to address that. I will quote a lot from a book called the Quran, which some people think that it's a book that is uh, full of violence and uh, verses that instigate Muslims against non-Muslims to fight and kill and stuff like that. We need to talk about the Quran. And the fourth thing is, I will mention the name Muhammad a lot, which people mistakenly think that he's someone who wrote the Quran, or maybe he is the founder of Islam, which is not true. This introduction or these definitions, it will take me around 10 to 15 minutes maximum, and then I'm going to the topic. So the first thing that I need to address is the word Islam. The word Islam linguistically in the Arabic language comes from the root of the word Se-le-me. Most Arabic words have roots, and most of those roots are from three-letter roots. Few words in Arabic have a four-letter root, but Islam, like most words in Arabic, comes from a three-letter root, which is Se-le-me. And this is the same root of three different words in the Arabic language too. One of them is istislam, which means submission. And the second one is salama, which means purity. And the third one is salam, which means peace. So the word Islam comes from the same root of those three words. Submission, purity, and peace. Surprisingly, the word Islam idiomatically the word Islam, Islamically, is a combination of those three meanings, those three words. The word Islam, idiomatically, means that if any person submits to the will of God and worships God alone, worships God purely, without any association with God, he or she will live in peace and harmony in this life and in the hereafter. Therefore, the word Muslim, in the Arabic language, doesn't mean literally a follower of Prophet Muhammad. The word Muslim in the Arabic language means literally someone who submits to the will of God and worships God alone, without association with God. Which means that before the birth of Prophet Muhammad, there were Muslims too. I will say the word Allah a lot. And actually, some people think that the word Allah means the God of the Muslims, which is not true. Actually, the word Allah is an Arabic word that means the one true God. So actually, Arab Christians and Arab Jews use the word Allah as well as Muslims to name the deity. This is the word Allah in Arabic. And I know that most of you don't know Arabic language, but still we can play a small game. This is the first page of the Arabic Christian Bible. This word, at the queen means Genesis. So this is the first paragraph of Genesis in Arabic. Let's play a small game. Who can figure out how many times this word, Allah, exists here in this paragraph? Count it. One, two, three, four, five, six. So the word Allah exists six times in the first paragraph alone of Genesis. Seventeen times in the whole page. Thousands of times all through the Bible. So when Muslims say there is no God except Allah, it's not only that this should not offend Christians and Jews or people coming from a Christian or a Jewish background, this actually unites us. But Muslims believe that Allah is unique. 
Muslims believe that he is alone the creator of all that exists. So he's the one who created human beings, the one who created man, so he does not look like any man. He's the one who created animals, he does not look, not look like any animal. He created plants, he doesn't look like any plant. He is unique. There's a verse in the Quran that describes God. It says, there is nothing like unto him, which means anything that your mind can imagine, he is beyond. I will quote a lot from a book called the Quran. What is the Quran? I know that also, probably, uh, most of you come from a Christian or a Jewish background, even if people with no faith now, but at least from a Christian background. And Christians have the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Quran simply is the last testament. It is the last revelation of God. The Quran is also the principal source for every Muslim's faith and practice and it deals with all subjects that concern human beings, including wisdom, doctrine, worship, and law. There are two main basic themes for the Quran. The first one is the relationship between God and His creation, and the second one is the relationship between people, one and another of them. And the Quran provides guidelines for a just society, proper human conduct, and equitable economic principles. Uh, Muslims don't only believe in the Quran. Muslims believe in all the books of God. Muslims believe in the Torah that was given to Moses, peace be upon him. Muslims believe in the Gospel that was given to Prophet Jesus, son of Mary, peace be upon him. And Muslims believe in the Torah and also the Quran which was given to Muhammad, peace be upon him too, etc., etc., because we also believe that there were other books before these books, like the Psalms of David, like the scrolls of Abraham. Let me show you what the Quran says about these books. What do you think the Quran will say about the Torah that was given to Moses? The Quran says, Surely we did send down the Torah to Moses, therein was guidance and light, by which the prophets who submitted themselves to Allah's will judge the Jews. So the Torah was mentioned in the Quran as a source of guidance and light. Anything about the Gospel? The Quran says, We sent Jesus, son of Mary, confirming the Torah that had come before him, and we give him the Gospel, in which was guidance and light. So the Gospel as well, which was given to Jesus, son of Mary, peace be upon him, was mentioned as a source of guidance and light. Actually, this is a verse from the Quran. I am hiding it now because I don't want you to read it while I'm introducing it. It's a very dear verse to my heart because it's simply an answer to a question that I used to have in my mind for so many years. For so many years when I used to see people fighting each other, I used to wonder, why did God create us from different backgrounds and people are fighting each other? Men and women, those who are men and women understand, whites and blacks, for centuries there were problems between whites and blacks, Arabs today, problems, Pakistanis, problems, Koreans, problems. Wasn't it a better idea that we could have been all from one background instead of people fighting each other? God could have created us all white, speaking Italian and eating pizza. That's it. Or actually, we could have been all Chinese, eating Chinese. This would have been good for me, by the way. But I read the Quran and I found the answer to this question. God Almighty said in the Quran, all mankind, he's not saying all Muslims, so he's talking to each and every one in this room, all mankind, we created you from male and female and made you into nations with an S and tribes with an S that you may know each other. And I stopped at this point and I thought to myself, imagine that we could have been all from one background, one sex, one color, speaking one language, eating the same food. This life could have been so boring. 
So there's no chance to get to know each other and discover each other. Of course, many businesses like tourism will go out of business because travel where, see what? It's a boring world. And the rest of the verse says, Surely the most honored of you in the sight of Allah are the Arabs. I'm sorry, not the Arabs. The Jews. It says, surely the most honored of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. Doesn't matter if he's male or female, doesn't matter from which nation or which tribe, if he is more righteous, then he is more honored. To talk about Prophet Muhammad, I need to talk a little bit about the concept of Prophet who did stand. Because Muslims believe that there's only one God. Muslims also believe that there's only one humankind because there's no difference between us. Men are not better than women. Whites are not better than blacks. Europeans are not better than Arabs. Arabs are not better than Indians. So if there's only one God and only one humankind, this means that there's only one sender and only one recipient. If there's only one sender and only one recipient, why would anyone say anything? that the same sender, God, will send to the same recipient, the humankind, contradicting messages. To confuse them? Of course not. So Muslims believe that it was never religions with an S. It was always one religion. Not the religion of Muhammad. Not the religion of Jesus. Not the religion of Moses. But rather the religion of God. Allah in Arabic language, God with a capital G in English, Dieu in French. In Dutch is what? God? Chot. Okay, good. I forgot to tell you Dach in the beginning, by the way. Uh, so, God sent one religion to all humankind with many messengers through time and with many books. So it's all one religion, with one God, to the same humankind, and many books of the same religion, many messengers of the same religion. If it's only one <coughs> religion, for everybody it has to be suitable. What in the world is suitable for everybody? No one just, no one probably offers you tea before he asks you first, do you drink tea? Maybe you don't drink tea. No one offers you coffee before asking you, do you drink coffee? Maybe you don't drink coffee. What is the only thing that people bring you without asking you? Ask water. Why? What's the difference between water and tea? Isn't uh, they are just liquids. Water? No one ever asked you. If you ever drink water, it's even a funny question. Because water doesn't have a color. Because water doesn't smell anything. Because water tastes good for all people because it neither salty nor sweet. That's why it's acceptable for all people. So if there's only one religion and it has to be suitable for all people, it shouldn't be limited. It shouldn't be called after someone. It shouldn't be called after a group of people. It shouldn't be called after a geographic region. It shouldn't be limited. <coughs> Hinduism is named after Hind, India, a geographic region. Judaism after the tribe of Judas. Christianity after Jesus Christ, human being, a beautiful human being. Buddhism after Buddha. Islam after who? Not named of the Prophet Muhammad. Muslims love Muhammad so much, but they get offended when they are called Muhammadians. Why? Don't they love him? They love him. But they are not Muhammadan, they are Muslims like him and like Jesus and Moses and Abraham and all of those. <clears throat> I just try to simplify uh, this. So Muslims believe in all the messages and all the books. Maybe I'm lying to you. And when I turn my back to you, I just believe in Muhammad and the Quran. I told you the Quran is the principal source for every Muslim's faith and practice. We have this verse twice in the Quran. It says, say, we believe in Allah. We believe in Allah. And the revelation given to us, which is the Quran, and the revelation given to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes, and
and the revelation given to Moses and Jesus, and the revelation given to all the prophets from their Lord, we make no difference between one and another of them. And we submit to Allah, which means, and we are Muslims, which means, I cannot be a Muslim if I exclude any one of these. If I exclude Jacob, I'm not Muslim anymore. It cannot be Muslim. I have to accept it all. Accept this religion with all its prophets, all its books, should be the big difference between one and another of them. Therefore, Prophet Muhammad is not the founder of Islam like some people were told. Muhammad was rather one of the messengers of Islam, the last and final messenger of Islam, a colleague of Jesus and Moses and Abraham, a graduate of the same school from which they graduated, the school of God. His traditions are called the Sunnah the number two source of Islamic knowledge and legislation, <clears throat> and his people used to call him the trustworthy and the truthful. Pagan Arabs loved him so much, they called him the trustworthy and the truthful. This is before he became a prophet. After he became a prophet, things changed. They opposed him hard, they tried to stop him by all means, they actually tried to kill him several times, and they killed some of his followers. The very first martyr in Islam is not a man at all, but a woman, Lady Sumaya. She was jabbed in her private parts by a spear by one of the biggest Islamophobes. And they tortured him and his followers, and they negotiated with him. They told him, stop preaching what you're preaching. What do you want? Money? We will make you the most rich. Power? We will make you the king of Arabia. <clears throat> Women, we will marry you from the most beautiful women. But please, stop preaching this message. And he refused to compromise his freedom of speech. He said, if they put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand to stop preaching this message, I won't stop until the message is conveyed or I die conveying it. <clears throat> He was the most beautiful example for all people because he was not just a prophet. He was also a, a father, a husband, a merchant, a politician, a negotiator, a teacher, and a warrior. But he taught Muslims how to fight. And he told them that they should not kill innocent people. They should not kill non-combatants, which is another topic that exists in one of my videos. One of my films is called Jihad on Terrorism, which is something that you should really watch. He gave hope to billions of people through his teachings that inspired people a lot. One of his beautiful teachings that have shaken me a lot is when he said, if you are planting a tree and the end of the world came, just go ahead and plant it quickly. I know that this may not make sense for many of you. Why should people be planting trees at the end of the world? It's not only that we will not eat from it, there are no coming generations even to eat from it. But this is a very important tradition of Prophet Muhammad that explains the system in Islam. In Islam, God will not ask you about your results, but rather about your effort. Sometimes you do effort, but you don't get good results and you're not rewarded. God doesn't care about your results. Even the slide, your boss tells you, come here, show me your numbers, show me your sales, show me the production. God doesn't care about your numbers or your sale or your production. He cares about your effort. Did you do effort or not? <clears throat> and some non-Muslim intellectuals spoke highly about Prophet Muhammad because they were objective when they read his biography. One of them is the French historian, um, Lamartine. Lamartine wrote a book called L'Histoire de la Turquie, which means the history of the Turks. In this book he said, if greatness of purpose, smallness of means, and outstanding results are the three criteria of a human genius, who could dare to compare any great man with Muhammad? Mahatma Gandhi, this man of peace, he said about Prophet Muhammad, in, a, in an article that he published in Young India, some famous newspaper. 
I became more than convinced that it was not the sword that one had placed for Islam in those days in the scheme of life. It was the rigid simplicity, the utter self-effacement of the Prophet, the scrupulous regard for his pledges, his intense devotion to his friends and followers, his intrepidity, his fearlessness, his absolute trust in God and in his own mission. And the last one is <coughs> Wolfgang Goethe. Goethe, you know him, is the most famous European poet. He said, he is a prophet and not a poet, and therefore his Quran is to be seen as a divine law, not as a book of a human being made for education or entertainment. Now, let's talk about freedom of speech. <clears throat> when can freedom of speech be unlimited in Islam? Actually, I need to tell you a little bit about the lecture that I gave in Denmark. Usually after my lectures, we uh, distribute the um, evaluation forms, and by studying these evaluation forms, we found that 92% of the people who attend, they change their position from Islam to a better position. They can become neutral after where be, being, you know, haters of Islam, or they can become supporters of Islam. They can become supporters after being neutral. 7.5% remain as is, maybe they believe I lie, I beautify Islam, and 0.5% become Muslim. It's not the main aim, I'm not denying that it makes me happy, but it's not my main goal. But when I went to Denmark to give my lecture in a conference closed on Danish journalists, I was hoping 10% only would change their position from Islam to a better position. Because talking to journalists is different from talking to the public. 55% checked this question, yes, in the evaluation form. My respect to Prophet Muhammad increased after the presentation. <gasps> These are pictures from the, from the uh, uh, conference. Actually, uh, I sent them this invitation to attract them to come. It was a 3D box on it. There was, you are invited, and a bridge. When you open the box, you don't find an invitation. You find a beautiful word, something peaceful on that side, that says, the peoples of the East and the West are the branches of the same tree, and when one looks in the roots of the tree, something beautiful like that, and it's signed by a Danish journalist, I'm sorry, a Danish person that no one knows about. No one ever heard his name, Knud Hombo. And we made a website for him, www.knud-hombo.com. On the other side, there's a chocolate. On the chocolate, there's a sticker that says the venue, Marriott Copenhagen, and the date. If you pick up the chocolate to eat it, you find that the invitation is colorful and folded and stuck to the chocolate, the bottom of the chocolate. And in this invitation, everything is there in the event. Among them is my lecture, titled, When Can Freedom of Speech Be Limitless in Islam? Of course, at that time, Muslims in the world, in the whole world, were saying there are limits for freedom of speech. Non-Muslims were saying there are no limits for freedom of speech. So when the Imam coming to address them is saying that it can be limitless, then they have to attend. And, thanks God, most of the invitees attended and it was a successful conference. One of the main obligations of Muslims, one of the main rituals, ways of worship in Islam is to do something called enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. God says in the Quran, the believers, men and women, are protectors one of another. They enjoin what is good and they forbid what is evil. How can I forbid the evil in a country that doesn't grant me freedom of speech? I will find myself in jail. I can lose my life. Ask me about that. So when God tells me to enjoy the good and forbid the evil, then by default Islam gives the freedom of speech. 
in the life of Prophet Muhammad, there are many examples of freedom of speech. He changed the location of the army twice, not once, after an argument with one of his soldiers. And look at the soldier, how he talked to the Prophet. He told him, are we here in this position by revelation, which means God told you to place us here? Or is it about war and consultation and giving my opinion? The Prophet said, no, it's open for opinion. Tell me, what do you think? When the man saw that it's not a revelation from God and that he is free to talk and give his um, opinion, he said, I think we are here in the wrong place. The Prophet said, what do you think then? He said, we should be in front of the wells so that we can have water sources and we deprive them from the wells, the army of the enemy. The Prophet said, that's a good idea. This shows that there was freedom of speech with the Prophet. Also, in his house, there was a marital dispute, that, like the disputes that happened between husbands and wives. So he told his wife, Aisha, who would you like us to consult and bring someone to judge between us? Would you like me to invite your father to judge? She said, yeah, my father is fine. He sent to her father, her father came. And then when he came, the Prophet looked at Aisha and said, would you like to speak and tell him what happened? Or would you like me to tell him what happened? She said, no, you tell him what happened, but don't say except the truth. This shows also, of course, this is too much to be said to the Prophet who was called the trustworthy. Of course, her father jumped from his chair, wanted to punish her, and the Prophet here interceded, and he prevented him from touching. He said, no, Abu Bakr, we did not invite you for that. And this is not what we want from you. So Abu Bakr left the house angrily, and the Prophet looked at Aisha and said, see, I protected you from the man. But this shows that there was a big space for freedom of speech in the Muslim society with the Prophet himself. Let me show you that there was a big space for freedom of speech with God himself. In the Quran, it says that God announced to the angels that he, is, that he chose the human being to be the trustee on earth. And the angel's reaction was telling him, Will you place therein someone who will shed the blood and spread mischief on the earth while we are glorifying you and worshiping you? What did God do to the angel? Did he punish them because they spoke and expressed themselves? No. He told them, okay, you think that's not right? Show me, tell me all the names. They couldn't, they said, glory be unto you. We only know what you taught us. He said, Adam, tell them all the names. So Adam told them all the names and proved to them that this creature is not like any creature. This is a creature that has superiority in knowledge and he deserves to be the trustee on earth. But God did not punish the angel. This is my point here. God just proved to them that he is right. Abraham told God, my Lord, Show me how you give life to the dead. God said, don't you believe yet? He said, no, I believe. It's just to strengthen my faith. So God did not punish Abraham for expressing himself. God said, okay, Abraham needs an experiment. Take an experiment. Bring four birds, cut them into pieces, scatter them on the mountains, call them back. Your birds will come to you walking. Birds don't come walking, birds come flying. But Abraham was told before his lecture, what will be the result of the, uh, before his experiment, what will be the result exactly of this. But the point here is God did not punish Abraham for expressing himself. Moses said, my Lord, show me yourself. I want to look upon you. God said, you cannot see me, but look at the mountain. If it stands still in its place, then you shall see me. And then God revealed himself to the mountain. The mountain collapsed and Moses fainted. But he did not punish Moses for expressing himself. All that I have shown you proves that there's a big space for freedom of speech in Islam. But none of that says that it is limitless. What says that it's limitless? Few traditions of Prophet Muhammad. He said, 
Prophet Muhammad said, if the time comes that you see my nation afraid of telling a tyrant that he is a tyrant, then there is no hope for them. What do tyrants do? Tyrants kill. And the Prophet is saying, if you're afraid of telling the tyrant he's a tyrant in his face, there's no hope for you. Which means, no limits. Go to the end, even if it costs you your life. You will die one day. Die with dignity instead of getting run over by a car. He also said, the best of martyrs is the one who was killed by a tyrant for saying the truth and criticizing him in his presence. So he's encouraging people to speak the truth in the presence of tyrants, even if they can get killed. Because this is called reform. Societies can get reformed like that. When people oppose tyrants and say the truth. He also said the best form of jihad is a word of truth in the presence of a tyrant. All this proves that it has no limits when it is against a tyrant, when it is in the direction of a tyrant. And then I showed them who is Knud Hombo, the man whose name was on, her, on the invitation. Knud Hombo is actually the first convert to Islam in Denmark. When I went preparing for my conference, I started to dig and see the roots of Islam in Denmark. And I found that this man is the first convert to Islam in Denmark. He converted around 100 years ago. And guess what was his profession? He was a journalist. Like them. How did he die? A martyr of freedom of speech. He was killed by Mussolini for refusing his offer. Actually, who among you saw the film Omar al-Mukhtar, The Lion of the Desert? Okay, this film is by uh, Anthony Quinn. It's about Omar al-Mukhtar, the leader of the Libyan resistance against the uh, fascists. The, the Italian occupiers of Libya. At the end of the film, when Anthony Quinn was hanged, uh, was hung actually, and his glasses fell on the floor, who went and grabbed the glasses? A boy. What was his name? Ali. Ali Knud Hombo. He was not that young. He was 29 years old and he's a Danish journalist. He was like the right hand of Omar al-Mukhtar. He joined the Libyan resistance. This man, actually what happened is that when he became Muslim, he went to Morocco and he wanted to, to go driving to Hajj pilgrimage in Mecca. So he took his Chevrolet and he drove in that route in the northern desert and he wrote a beautiful book called Erkinen Brenner, or The Deserts Are Burning, where he wrote beautiful, <laughs> actually amazing uh, adventures. I think this book is even more uh, interesting than Harry Potter. It's really like that, something amazing. And 70% uh, of the book was in Libya, where he interacted with the Libyan resistance and with the Italians. Here, this is him with his uh, Chevrolet and this guide is a Libyan boy called Muhammad. At a certain part of the uh, journey, he was the guide. And this Muhammad, by the way, died four years ago in the age of 85. And this is an American called Starbucks who was with him during his uh, journey, but he died and they buried him in during the journey him and Muhammad. Here he wrote, the free Arabs of Serenaika. Those are the resistance. He said, I used to witness 30 executions in Benghazi every single day, taking this pictures with his camera. Um, he said this man was shot because he was standing in a, in a prohibited area. Another Arab victim. 
This is one of the two pictures that caused his death. Those are two Italian prisoners taken prisoners in the imprisonment camps of Omar al-Mukhtar. Mussolini did not want the Italian people to know that Italians are taken prisoners in Libya too. He sent him a German agent called Hans Joachim with a blank check. He said, write any amount of money, but don't publish what you have. And he refused. And this is the imprisonment camps. And those are other two Italian prisoners. And he was killed as a, a martyr of freedom of speech at the age of 29. The year after, actually, a group of uh, Danish journalists came visiting us in Bridges Foundation in Egypt, in our office. That was our office in Egypt before we closed. And this is his book in Arabic, in Danish, and we even published it in English also in, uh, on the internet. Liberty itself is important in Islam. God described Prophet Muhammad in the Quran as the liberator. God describes him saying he relieves them from their burdens and from the iron collars that were on them, from the iron chains that are on them. So the Prophet was mentioned in the Quran as a liberator. He's the very first generation of Muslims saw themselves as liberators, not as people who came to kill others. There was a, a famous dialogue between a famous companion of Prophet Muhammad, who was a very simple Bedouin, by the way, Rabbi ibn Amr, and between Rustum, the head of the Persian army, who asked him, who are you? What brought you from Arabia? You poor guys, we are Persia. A civilization of 2,000 years. And he told them, we came to liberate people and bring them out from the worship of creatures to the worship of the creator of creatures. And from the oppression of religions to the justice of Islam. What I focus on is how he perceived himself as someone who wants to liberate people. There was an incident in which the son of the ruler of Egypt at the time of Caliph Omar ibn Khattab, the ruler of Egypt was a great companion of Prophet Muhammad called Amr ibn al-As. His son was racing against some Egyptian Christians, horse race. And one of them won, and there was a fight, and he beat up one of them. So the Christian Egyptian took his mule and traveled all the way to Medina in Arabia. It took him like two months to file a claim against that boy. This in itself shows me that non-Muslims under the rule of Umar ibn Khattab had confidence, trusted that there is justice there. So he went and he filed a claim. Umar ibn Khattab brought both the ruler of Egypt and his son. His son confessed, said, yeah, I lost my mind, I lost my temper, and I beat him up. Umar said, okay, then take your revenge. He gave his wooden stick to the Egyptian, told him, take your revenge from him. He beat up the boy and then he told him, beat up his father, the ruler of Egypt. The Christian said, I took my revenge. He said, he could have never done that to you without the support of his father. And then he looked at the father and said, tell me, Amr, when did we start enslaving free people? Literally in Arabic language, he said, tell me, Amr, when did we start enslaving people who were born free? Which means that they looked at themselves as people coming to liberate the slaves, not to enslave, to liberate non-Muslims, not kill non-Muslims. This is how they looked at themselves. In Islam, freedom equals life. Killing is a major sin in Islam. You're not allowed to kill in Islam, except in war or accidentally, in an accident, like in a car accident. If you kill someone in a car accident or accidentally, you need to seek atonement from God. You need to seek forgiveness. You cannot seek forgiveness except when you do something which is free a slave. 
Now there is no slaves, so we have other options like fasting 60 consecutive days and paying the blood money, but at that time was freeing a slave. Which means that if you took life from someone by accident, you have to give life to someone dead. How? By giving freedom to someone deprived from freedom. So in Islam, freedom equals life. That's what God said in the Quran, never should a believer kill another believer except by mistake. If anyone kills a believer by mistake, he must free a Muslim slave and pay compensation to the victim's relatives. <sighs> Let's fight with each other now. What's coming next, I'm not ex expecting that you agree with it all. But it's a matter of perspective. It's about different perspective. I can have different perspective from you. The issue is, liberties of people will collide. I can't have, I can, what I can see as my freedom to practice is something that can hurt you. We need someone to put the boundaries for this freedom. We said that Islam says it is unlimited when it's against the pirate, but otherwise there should be boundaries for our freedoms in order not to collide. The issue is, who will put the boundaries? What about the ruler? If the ruler puts the boundaries, then he becomes a dictator. What about democracy? By democracy, we put the boundaries. Actually, the democratic way is accepted in Islam, that the majority's opinion is accepted, except when it is about freedom and liberties. Because that way, you are allowing the majority to oppress the minority. Let me give you an example. In Switzerland, if you're a Jew, you can have a power for your synagogue. If you're a Christian, you can have a tower for your church. If you're a Hindu, you can have a tower for your temple. If you're a Muslim, you cannot have a minaret for your mosque. Why? By democracy. By democracy, the majority oppressed a minority. So here, when it comes to freedom and liberties, we need someone who knows more than us more about the majority and the minority and the men and the women and the whites and the blacks and everybody to give them the freedom. Let me show you even... Um, I have here... Uh, what about unleashing freedoms? Let people do whatever they want. In this case, people will be enslaved to their own whims and desires. So actually, Muslims found that the best thing is something okay. I'll show you something that happened through democracy. The United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, which is listing the rights of human beings, not allowing any government or any dictator to violate them. Allow the right of marriage. In article number 16, it says, men and women of full age without any limitation due to race, nationality, or religion have the right to marry and to find a family. So by this declaration, no Government can ban marriage because marriage is a human right. What about divorce? What if someone mischose his or her partner? Do they have the right to dissolve the marriage? Don't you think it's a human right? It's a human right. But it's not stated, not listed in the list of the human rights of the United Nations Declaration until today. Why? 70% of the customers of the United Nations who pay the salaries of the United Nations do not have marriage in their religion. In Christianity, there is no marriage. There is, I'm sorry, do not have divorce in their religion. So in Christianity, there is no divorce in their religion. 
The United Nations compromised. God doesn't compromise. God allowed the right to dissolve the marriage for men and for women because it's a human right. Dissolving the marriage is discouraged, but it's a human right. What if someone mischooses his partner or her partner? God says in the Quran, divorce is allowed twice. After that, either men retain women on reasonable terms or release them with kindness, and it is not lawful for men to take back from your wives any of your dowry which you have given them, except when both parties fear that they would be unable to keep the limits ordained by Allah, then if you fear that they would not be able to keep the limits ordained by Allah, then there is no sin on either of them if she gives back the dowry or part of it for her khul'a, which means for her, which means that if the man divorces, he doesn't have the right to take any of his marriage gifts. But if she asks for divorce, then she has to give him back his dowry or a part of it as they agree with each other. So here I find that God himself has put for us the um, limits and the boundaries of freedom. For example, in one of the verses it says, Believers, let not some men among you laugh at others who may after all be better than them. Nor let some women laugh at others who may after all be better than them, nor defame, nor be sarcastic to each other, nor call each other by offensive nicknames. Believers, avoid making too many assumptions. Some assumptions are sinful. Do not spy on one another or speak ill of people behind their backs. Would any of you like to eat the flesh of your dead brother? No, you would hate it. So God here is giving the example of by biting someone, speaking ill about someone in his back, like you're eating his own flesh when he's died, when he's dead. God is ever relenting, most merciful. So this is just one of the things that where God is putting the boundaries of freedoms here. Like that, I think we uh, finished our... Uh, presentation and I can take from you any question. So I'm opening the floor for questions. And before that, <coughs> let me quickly tell you, as I told you, I'm a filmmaker, I made three films. These three films now are in one box. It's called The Fog is Lifting series of documentaries, four and a half hours about Islam. The first one is called Islam in Brief, which is in 31 languages today, including Hebrew. The second one is called Jihad on Terrorism, which is today in 17 languages, also including Hebrew. And the third one is called Islam in Women, which was launched recently, one, one week ago, in London. The three of them are in a box. We sell it for about 12 euros. It's free for you actually, and free, especially for faculty staff. But you have to drop an email to the um, uh, student union, the UT uh, student union, and they would be sending you your free uh, yani, uh, box and Okay? Now, any questions?